ladies and gentlemen. If you're watching on YouTube, there she is. She's the reigning AIG Women's British Open champ. I know is Ashley Simon from way back in the day when she was just a little tut growing up in South Africa, but she's on our On The Mark show. Ashley, thanks for joining us, man. How are you? I'm good. Thanks to you. Thanks for having me on, Mark. I'm great. It's a thrill to talk with you, man. It's people like you that have made me a huge fan of LPGA golf. And I was glued to the television just a few months ago when you were freezing coming down the stretch there, <laughs> notching probably your career defining achievement. But before we go there, um, you know, Ashley Buhai, uh, for a lot of the people in the LP who follow the LPGA tour, they know you, but for a lot of our fans, I guess, they're unfamiliar with who you are. So tell us the quick story and then we'll dive into lessons we can learn from you. Um, yeah. Uh, previously, like you said, Ashley Simon for many years, that's how everybody knew me. Grew up in Johannesburg, South Africa. Um, you know, had a very good amateur career in South Africa, won everything they, very they good. wanted to win. <laughs> um, yeah. uh -huh. You know, and uh, turned professional at 18 and made my way onto the Ladies European Tour first. Um, won my third uh, tournament as a professional and thought, well, this is just going to continue. The life's great. Mm -hmm. um, but as you all know, this this game throws you a few curveballs and it has many ups and downs and I've been professional now for since 2000, middle of 2007. So what, 15, 16 years. It's, it's been a long journey. Um, got my card full time on the LPGA, got it back in 2000 and end of 2013. So since 2014, been playing full time on the LPGA. And even though she lives in Florida now, folks, so she's got a lekker South African accent. <laughs> I, I, I want to, I want to backtrack a little bit. Um, and this is for the young ladies watching and perhaps for the parents of young golfers, maybe girls watching. I want to know how an Ashley Simon got into golf because in South Africa, we athletes, right? Everyone's spending time outside all the time. Golf. How did it come about with you? Yeah, I come from a sport loving family. Um, my dad got me into the game. Mm -hmm. He noticed from a, a, when I was a young age that I had very good hand eye coordination and could catch a ball you know growing in south africa we have played cricket and yeah, yeah. i could could hit a cricket ball and kick a soccer ball so i thought let me see if she can hit a golf ball and um that's how it basically started and at the age of six i was dragging him to the driving range and i, I just loved it you now i played a lot of sport competitively at a, at a higher level field hockey and tennis in south africa but golf was always in my blood and um mm -hmm. you know, i was telling my my grade two teacher that i was going to be a professional golfer one day and uh made it happen hey can you prophesy that i'm going to win the lottery in just a few weeks time? <laughs> hey, no, no. jokes aside I, I, you know golf is it can be a lonely thing you know if you play on a team like you say field hockey you got comrades you got folks that you hang out with practice mm. with golf is that time where you're grinding on the range a lot of the time by yourself so advise the the young golfers listening to this because at times it can sort of be just downright lonely and and life on the tour that that's that, that's not all glamour at times too huh no um you know everything has its ups and downs but i think that's why i was drawn so much to golf because it's it's all on you and you yeah. know if you work hard hopefully you reap the rewards and if not you can only hold yourself accountable so you know you have to work hard for it um there are lonely times but you know, the highs make it all worth it. And when it comes through, uh, there's no feeling like it. And, you know, it makes all the hard work really worth it. Okay. Uh, you just glossed over it, but I'm going to now blow your, blow your trumpet. Okay. So you're the youngest ever to win the South African amateur stroke play and match play titles. Um, that's like the USAM, British AM folks um, for those global audience. You're the first player in over 100 years to win the South African Ladies Open three times, and you did this as an amateur. Am I correct, right? You uh, yes, first at 14, then 16, and then finally as a professional. Yeah, and then your third time as a professional. You yes. turned pro at 18. You win your third event as a pro, the Catalonia Open, Catalonia Masters in 07. Mm -hmm. Okay, I need to ask you this question because you've talked about the inevitable ups and downs in golf. But when you were an amateur, I mean, everybody knew you. I, I remember going to an event in Johannesburg and and I was a young, up aspiring teacher and my brother had been winning stuff and we show up there and we wanted to go and shake your hand because you were like the bell of the ball. Right? <laughs> so, so I want to know, 
uh, sort of keeping yourself in check, keeping yourself mm-hmm. humble, if you will, because you know golf is going to cut the legs out from under you quickly. How does a young person deal with all those accolades and all that stuff? And you're like, you know, I, when I met you, you were just Ashley. You were wearing your Springbok blazer, your Protea blazer, <laughs> and you were just so unassuming and humble. So I'd love to know the secret for the listeners, please. I think you're the people you surround yourself with, you know, mm-hmm. family and friends. Um, and and that, that's what's been the biggest thing for me is my family have always kept me grounded. And one thing they tried so hard to do is give me somewhat of a normal upbringing, you know. At the time, so many kids that were, you know, accomplishing things at sports, people were homeschooling, and my dad's like, that's not going to happen. I'm going to send you to school even if you sit there and do nothing, but you're going to have your friends around you to keep you grounded. You're going to try somewhat of a normal childhood. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, I think, what it's about. And I've been very fortunate to have such a great support system um, from South Africa, from my parents, and, and my school it played a huge part in that too. Um and, and even your parents, your parents got, I had a conversation with them and my dad at, at 14, because obviously they've been through it with Trevor right. and watching you guys both be competitive and, and helped us along the way and, you know, gave us some advice too. All right. Um, I have the luxury of being 51, uh, close on 52. Yeah. A year is young and fabulous. Um, you know, but you look back and, and, and I look back on myself going, man, if I had it to do over, I would do this. Or if I had it to do, Mm -hmm. I I would do that. Now, I'm not discounting where I am because golf has blessed us in the biggest way. As you're looking back now, because now you're still 33 years young or whatever you are, and I shouldn't be dating this because this is a podcast. But if you ever look back at what you did coming out as a young professional, are there things, lessons you learned, things you might have changed? Uh, Look back and and, and reminisce for us, please. Um, The only thing I probably would have changed is most likely based myself in the U.S. sooner. All right. Um, So, you know, full-time playing LPJ since 2014. Before that, I was in Europe. It was easy to go back and forth to South Africa. One flight, not much of a time change. But, you know, my husband, David, at the time was caddying for me. And we would come over for three months, live out of a suitcase, go back to South Africa because it's hard. You know, that's where your family is. That's where your roots are. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think... That's the only thing I would have changed is just giving myself that chance to base myself in the U.S. So travel wasn't so hectic for me. Um, have somewhere to call home on the weeks off where I could recharge. And I think that's what's been huge for me in the last two years. Um, COVID forced me to do that. I couldn't fly back to South Africa. Had friends in Palm Beach Gardens. Ended up staying here like in the area. And now this is where I've based myself for the last year and a half. But that in itself brings its challenges because, look, I moved my wife, Tracy, over here in 2001. Mm. I've been in college here. You know, all of her folks are over there in Durban in South yeah. Africa. And, and that in itself has got, is a challenge. I mean, your coach, who we're going to feature on this podcast, Doug, he's over there too. I mean, it's not all sunshine and lollipops, right? No, of course not. And it's hard being away from your loved ones. Um, mm. But it's the life we've chosen and, you know, done it from such a young age. So it's something we've become accustomed to, I, I think you could say. Um, but having Doug over there, thank goodness video yeah. is the way it is now. It's made our lives a lot easier than when we first started. And, you know, he also now, he works with Eric Van Rooyen for the last five years. So that's also been helpful. I'm go- I get to see him a lot more now that two of us are based in the States instead of just me. Mm-hmm. Um, and that he's able to come over a lot more than he used to. It sort of sounds, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, so correct me if I'm wrong, but um even with all your success as a young person then coming out and winning early. And then you won sort of consistency for a while, even though you were battling injury and, and, and stuff, mm-hmm. which I want to talk about. But it sounds to me like you're advising the aspirant professional or the young golfer from abroad who wants to come over here to the States to college or whatever. You mm-hmm. sort of thank them, look, it's great. And you got opportunity, but you're going to have to graft and, and there's no real guarantee. And it's sometimes it's challenging, right? Of course, it's it's very challenging and you've got to be willing to make that sacrifice, you know. Yeah. I think this is all I've ever wanted to do. So I was happy to make the sacrifices. You know? um, and now that I am, you know, 33 and people may say I'm on the high end of my career, especially <laughs> being a female. I don't like Hold to that. think that. I feel I'm, like, you know, playing the best golf of my career the last five years. Um, it kind of took me, I guess, 10 years to really find my feet. You know, I came out the gates hot. But I think consistency is what we really look for. The wins are great, but if you can have a consistent career and throw in the odd one every now and then, that's what it's about. Mm. Well, as you as a golfer, if they had to go and search you, 
you'll see the world rankings is progressively going down and you're at your career high water mark now at mm-hmm. age 33 yeah. and i'm i'm with you i feel like you know the recent victory uh, that's got to feel like you're a million bucks now and anything's achievable <laughs> but there have also been the challenges you've battled vertigo you have to have a procedure for that i mean god forbid mm-hmm. for an athlete and then you had a hip procedure done as well so my my wish for any aspirant young golfer coming out athlete even is to avoid injury because i'm related to a golfer who yes was the end of his career essentially mm-hmm. um i know you can speak motivationally to someone listening to this going dang i'm battling something physically now too so I, i'm just gonna let you have the microphone and, and go ahead with with what i know you have inside yeah i mean obviously we would love to avoid injuries but i think in sport it's not really possible for most of people's careers um but it's about trying to you know, take advantage of the people you have around you, surround your people, surround yourself with the best help you can. Um, the best thing I did was start working with a full-time physio on tour five years okay. ago. Uh-huh. Um, and that has, she works with about eight of us. She travels with us every year. Her name is Annelise um, Bideau. She's French, Australian. She studied in France, moved to Oz, studied there, and uh, mm-hmm. now is on tour with us. So she keeps my body in check and tries to keep it the same just about every week um and to keep those little niggles away and then obviously we have trainers i base myself in florida with a guy ken mcdonald and we do all the off-season stuff together um i'm not going to beat around the bush i hate gym i hate training (laughs) it's who i who i've always been but i do what i need to do in order to keep my body where it needs to be and injury free Mm. um I, I I I want to talk about the vertigo just because this is fascinating mm. for me. Um, <laughs> first first yeah. off, I, I didn't even know until I went and read your bio a little bit. I knew mm. who you are, what you were doing always. And, I, and, and Ashley, to me, was someone who I was a fan of and watched your results. And then you go mm. digging in there and I feel, uh, and I see you've battled that and you had to have a yeah, procedure done. How did yeah. this bad? I mean, how did you find <laughs> this out? Well, um, I was at the second stage of Q school and I woke up in the third round and fell out of bed actually oh, um, really? with LPJ Q school. And obviously you feel horrific. Um, went to the emergency in, in Florida and they were like, you've just got vertigo. And I had to now play two rounds and get through that. Um, so th- I had to go to a rules official say, is it okay if David tees the ball up, picks it out the hole for me because anything bending down was just terrible. Um, mm-hmm. Luckily I given myself enough cushion because it was, top 80 had to make it um and i ended up finishing i think in the top 10 which was a pretty was pretty good effort after that and then it just still kind of lingered and um that was about that was in 2013 i think yeah had the procedure no it was in 2016 i think yeah uh well the first time it occurred was 2013 anyway you know and what then, I, um I, we, we figured it out and uh since then thank goodness it's been fine you, you know what I travel like you do with my job and, you know, there's mm. hotel rooms sometimes by yourself. I can imagine, you know, with your mind can wander and you're feeling like that in the morning, like, oh my goodness, is this the end? I mean, that must have been mm. a mental challenge of note, huh? Yeah, it sure was a huge mental challenge. Um, but I feel that's when I'm at my best, when my back's against the wall. Um, and I don't know, I think in a lot of South Africans and golfers in general, we have so much resilience. I think coming from a small country, having to travel from young ages, you know, working really hard for what you want. Yeah. Um, I think it's built in us. Okay. Built in you. Let's get to it, right? Um, mm-hmm. You've had multiple wins around the globe, bunches on the LET, a whole lot on the mm-hmm. South African Ladies Tour. Then comes the Open Championship at Muirfield, for the record. <laughs> First time ever <laughs> they've had a Ladies Open there. Um, you build up the big lead, Ash, and we're all salivating, right? And I was working, so I couldn't watch, but I'm on the golf course and I work alongside Dottie Pepper, who you will know. Mm-hmm. And, yes. and so we go out on the course and you're just teeing off and we're going into the broadcast. I think it is um, time fails me. And I get a text from her going, Ash just made a triple. <laughs> and I was like, oh, geez, really? And so she and I are what we should be calling golf but we're watching our telephones to get updates <laughs> so, so i want to start here you start the final you played beautifully for three rounds mm-hmm. in very difficult conditions final day it's blustery it's typical over there and 
mm-hmm. you come out and you got this big lead. I think five strokes, was it, or something like that? Yeah, five shots. And all of a sudden, five strokes are gone. And now you got to show Ashley resilient. Um, mm-hmm. Speak about, let's relive that some, because I think there's something to be learned from that. Yeah. Um, felt, I didn't know where I was in the tournament, to be honest, how many mm-hmm. shots lead I had. I hadn't seen leadable for a little bit. I thought it was one or two ahead. And um, hit hit the drive left on 15. I didn't even know what was there. I said to my caddy, what's up the left? Yeah. Just bunkers. I'm like, oh, okay, I'll just, you know, knock it out into the fairway and we'll carry on. And I got there and it plugged off the bounce up the face, could only go backwards. Uh, Try to dig it out, thinned it. And before I knew it, in the rough, stayed in the rough and um, made triple. But I think it almost happened, it happened so quickly that I didn't really have time to dwell on it you you could say Uh, yeah um and i looked up at the scoreboard and i saw okay i'm joining for the lead and my caddy said to me tanya said all right three holes to go let's get back on it and at that point i said to myself well you haven't lost the lead yeah so i was still in it and i'd mentioned numerous times i'd started working with duncan mccarthy um mental coach at the beginning of the year and i just went back to the steps that i tried to do the whole week focus on my tempo that was my only thought and just try to do that one one thing to the best of my ability going in hey um you make it sound so easy it's not that easy for <laughs> <if> anyone's <laughs> watching this. okay you said focus on your tempo and you mm-hmm. there was a quote that i found and i've got it written down and i mm-hmm. recite this to a lot of folks at times and um, if i ever have the good fortune of calling your golf i'll bring this up and you were going with and correct me if i'm wrong here Slow is smooth and smooth is fast. And when I happen to watch the recap of the event, your swing pace was mm. silky. It was like straight out of heaven for me. And under all that pressure with all of those variable conditions and crosswinds and just nasty stuff, you just looked like you were a metronome on a clockwork as this rhythm was so clean. Was it as simple as just going with this mantra the whole time? It really was um, because that's how my swing has been and what we've always focused on. The minute I've tried to force it or get some extra distance, I get quick from the top, everything goes out. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I went searching at the beginning of the year to find distance as we all do. But, you know, Doug let me do it. And he's like, okay, if we're going to do it, we'll do it this way. And it threw everything out of sync. And he's like, right. So we we got to April and he's like, now we're going back to what we know. (laughs) He's like, you're, you're too old to be starting this we know it works for you and we just got to make that better don't try to reinvent the wheel mm-hmm. um and especially in windy conditions yeah. you know it's not about overpowering the ball you need to take spin off the ball flat it and doug's given me the ability to do that and i think that's why i love british open so much and why they they play into my favor well i was about to say it's certainly of all of your major championship results that's mm-hmm. where you've had the most success aside from the win even um mm-hmm. Uh, along those the smooth swing thing like they're girls ladies that hit the thing farther than you do but when i watched you play that it almost looked like you weren't concerned with that at all you were like i'm going to hit my ball and then hit it again and hit it again Uh, and i think there's something that all golfers can learn from that yeah um you know do what works best for you Uh, and i've gotten this far in my career doing me yeah. And early on in my career as well, I think when you first come out, you're intimidated. You see all these players, you see what they're trying to do. Not everybody's built the same. Not everybody swings the same. So, you know, we've we've built my swing for 13 years. Mm-hmm. And um, the nice thing now is if something goes out, it's never anything very big. Um, it's very small and we know what to work on. And as I said, don't try to reinvent the wheel. Just do you. Yeah. Now. For the folks who watched, so you're now tied for the lead, three holes to play. Mm-hmm. You hang your way in there. Um, I, I'm getting confused on this, so you must help me. But mm-hmm. I know a little birdie told me that early in the week or in preparation for this open at Muirfield, you'd watch YouTube videos of Ernie else yeah. winning there. Is this correct? <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's so, correct. We're on the course. Yeah. <laughs> and I was showing my caddy the videos. Ernie had some mm-hmm. unreal saves from green from bunkers and greenside yeah. bunkers over there um, en route to his victory at Muirfield. Um, so you, you did watch the footage, right? Yes, I did, yeah. I would argue that the bunker shot you hit to ice this mm-hmm. thing 
was better than any of them that he hit. So, so walk us through that bunker shot. First off, that was that was to win it, but you got it up and down mm-hmm. to get into the playoff too. Am I right? Uh, no, I, I hit the green in two, oh, yeah. okay, right. but I had a long putt, and but I had I knocked it like five foot past, and had to hold about a five footer okay, to get there. into the playoff. Okay, stop there. So yeah, right. So now you've got five feet to get in the playoff. Mm-hmm. Big crowds, mind spinning stuff. Help the listener to deal with that pressure moment. What 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 went through Ashley's mind? What was your routine? What do you do? My routine was stick to the steps that. I do. So Duncan and myself, we've created these steps without my routine and we've got me to close the door on every step. So I have four steps. I read the pat from mm-hmm. either side. That's one step. Close the door. Close um, the door means it's done. I close the door. It's done. Because what, what we found, first of all, was I was so letting the read and then the plum and then the feel of the green, like all filter into each other. And then you stake and guess yourself. Yeah. So we've got me to, okay, first thing is just do your steps and do your steps well, because you can control that. Um, So it was a case of read the part, close the door, plumber, close the door, line it up, close the door, step up and hit it. And that's all I thought about. Um, Because if I've done those things well, and I've read it like I've wanted to, and I hit the part where I wanted to, and it doesn't go in, it just is what it is. Yes, it's hard to accept more Mm -hmm. times than others, but that's something that has helped me cope with the pressure and that's all i said to myself i didn't think of the magnitude of the moment just do these things well and hopefully it'll take care of the outcome sounds so simple yeah you know but but it's it's there's there's, it's really, there's yeah. a lot of there's a lot of mm. gravity there's a lot of gravity and mm. wisdom to the simplicity of mm. that yeah i think we tend to overcomplicate things and so often when you go back to doing the simple things well it takes care of the bigger things or like we say the outcome we become so focused on the outcome that we forget how to get to it yeah. if we just do the little things well and that because that's what we can control we can't control the outcome necessarily um but we can control our lineup you know keeping your rhythm those sort of small things we like to say okay i was getting ahead of myself i had to get to this bunker shot now we are <laughs> right it was the yeah how many is playoff? I mean, it's it's dark fourth, outside. Fourth, fourth playoff, playoff hole, which I didn't even know then how many we had played, to be honest, because you're so focused and locked up in it all. Well, I mean, it's looks it looks frigid out there. The sun's going mm-hmm. down. It's, it's it's just grisly, and yeah. you're in this green side sand. It wasn't just green side sand. It was you actually removed mm-hmm. from the edge of the green, so it was a longish bunker shot mm-hmm. to hole cut on the opposite side of the green to where you mm-hmm. were. Not easy by any stretch. So easy if I was the on-course announcer there to say, this is the kind of one where you just dump this thing on the green and you get a tumbling yeah. sound and 10 feet's not bad. But mm-hmm. no, not you. You get in there, clip close to the ball, <laughs> in there, flies it the whole way, lands, spins in there a couple, three feet, and you win. Um, look, Gary would be proud of you, and that's Gary. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so, so talk us through the shot, please. Um, well, I think like the viewers and watching it, and like you say, it it looked a lot more difficult than it really was. I'd like to think. Uh, Obviously, the the okay. no the moment makes it huge and, and make the moment makes it difficult. But it was downwind. Um, I had green to work with. I only really had to, you know, throw it four four meters on, which I kind of did. Yeah. And let the rest just do the work. Um, I think say Gary would be proud. I have been ranked number one in bunkers this year on the LPGA, and that's exactly There's what my caddy said to me. She <laughs> said. The- uh, and she gave me the call and she said, well, show them why you're number, ranked number one in bunkers this year. Mm-hmm. You know, whenever I'm in a bunker, I'm very comfortable, to be honest. So I just did what I thought I had to do and the elements took care of it, took yeah. care of it running out to the hole. Well, you're awfully humble. You did flex a bit with the bunker <laughs> ranking. There, but I, okay, so you did what you need to do. You know what mm-hmm. to do. So so what yeah. are the keys out of the sand? Because greenside bunkers, for most of the folks listening to this, are driving them mm-hmm. bananas. So, so what is Ashley's key to the good greenside bunker shot? Um, so also that week, Doug had been with me, and the, the sand was really heavy. It often is at links courses. Right. So yeah. we actually weakened my grip. Um, a weak grip in bunkers for me is key. All right. Helps you slide it. I, obviously, I get the club out, um, out quickly and and up, and then I try bounce the toe. That's my feeling. Bouncing the toe through the stand at a fast pace to obviously get that that check on it. 
Um, I kind of like that because if you're trying to bounce the toe, it gets mm -hmm. the shaft up a little bit more, which yeah. gets the face playing a bit mm -hmm. more weakly through the ball. So you can be aggressive. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. And that's what I try always do is try to be aggressive through the sand. And when you over this thing, I guess the ball mm -hmm. position is a little forward. I couldn't see from mm -hmm. the angle of the shot. Yeah. Are you trying to hit a specific spot in the sand or is this just you've rehearsed it so much that you just put no. it it's a case of practices over the years is taking care of where you want to hit it and the mm -hmm. grip position, the ball position. And, um, you know, if I'm accelerating through, should take care of not having to think of where you're trying to hit the sand. And you at a dress didn't really look like you were tending to your forward side or anything. You were mm -hmm. just pretty standard, slightly open with your stance and you swing down those lines. Yeah. The, the, you know, it was a little bit of a downhill lie. So mm -hmm. also I didn't want to get too far forward because yeah. They wanted to get up. So I kind of just on that bunker shot had a, a more of a neutral stance. But generally, I would obviously favor, you want to favor more to your left side. Yeah. Um, you know, we like to think of it probably as 60, 40 or 70, 30 on the left side. Okay. The bunker shot's behind <clears throat> us now. It, it was one worth the highlight reels. Go search mm -hmm. for it on YouTube, folks. Um, now, I'm assuming you're going to tell me that over that putt to Witten, you're going through your close the door stuff. Re yeah, completely. That's God. exactly what I did. I swear it's. <laughs> And that's what just keeps you focused in the moment, you know, because if you start thinking of the magnitude of it, if I hold this, when I hold it, this means I'm an open champion, mm -hmm. you know, that all that stuff could just be too overwhelming. So I think that's why once I knocked it in, my reaction was what it was because it was just like, oh my gosh, this has actually finally happened. So it dawned, so it dawned on you then because a colleague of mine wrote a beautiful piece about it. Um, mm -hmm. And the picture that they're, put beside his article was the picture of you where you'd sort of pull the cap down over your eyes or your face a little mm. and it was like yeah. you were like oh my goodness I've just done this I mean was yeah. that where you were mentally and emotionally when when it all settled completely that's exactly where I was um and you know when you're in the moment everything feels like a blur only you only really realize that I've seen footage afterwards since um and then I think afterwards, once everybody ran onto the green, once obviously Dave ran on, picked me up, then you really realize what you've accomplished. Yeah. Okay. And I'm going to ask questions that people don't ask. Um, mm -hmm. Did you stay there that evening or did you fly straight out? No, we stayed there. The RNA were great. They kept uh, the <laughs> players' pavilion open for us. There were about maybe 30 of us, uh, friends from tour, um, mm. my family that lives down in London. Some other friends came up from other places, South Africans, and we stayed there till about 12 o'clock. And I was exhausted. I mean, I only got done with press at 10.30. And eventually I, I had to say, okay, guys, I just need, I need to go back now. A bit of a sleep. Um, but we missed our flight the next day. There was no chance that um, my husband was going to make that flight, that's for sure. <laughs> um, so luckily on the Sunday morning, I did wake up and I was like, wow. if somehow I pull this off today, there's no chance we're making that 6.45 flight to London. So I don't know. I thought maybe I should book it. Maybe I shouldn't. I went on and booked a whole new ticket just in case. Yeah. Some people say I probably could have jinxed myself, but I was like, whatever happens today, it's going to be a long day and I'm probably going to be exhausted tomorrow. So, you know, luckily it all went my way and we were able to um, um, celebrate and I flew out back to the States on uh, Tuesday. Champagne on the airplane? <laughs> Not quite, no. <laughs> I was too exhausted, to be honest. <laughs> what a wonderful story. I mean, what a great way to put the exclamation point on a career that was destined for greatness, had its trials and ups and downs and stuff, but now you're sort of in the place where all of us were sort of expecting of you, mm -hmm. which sort of leads me to my final question. Public expectation is one thing. Private personal expectation mm -hmm. is entirely another. Help people deal with expectation because I think sometimes our own expectations are the ones that might trip us up the most or they kind of maybe define how we're going to approach something. And maybe oftentimes we don't play as free as what we should because we're trying not mm. to fail. Uh, you, you get where I'm going here? Yeah, definitely. So uh, we get in our own way. Um, you know, I think the best thing that happened to me was in a way, you know, David had caddied for me for eight years. It was fantastic, you know, to have your, we weren't married yet, but have your partner. We won together twice in Europe. There's no better feeling, but I'd become so reliant on him because nobody knew me better. Nobody knew my game better other than Doug. Mm -hmm. And why was my amateur career so good? Because I played free golf. And as we get older, um, you know, there's responsibilities in life. You think more 
about those things. Um, when you're an amateur, you just play free golf. And I had to get back to doing that because that's what I did well. And when we decided to, you know, for him to caddy for somebody else, it took me, I'd say, six months to find my feet again. That was yeah. in 2017. But then I started to play free golf again and play the golf that I knew how to play and be creative Um, because that's what did so many good things for me. Um, But the expectation, sure, there were many years I was like, I'm not where I I pictured myself to be, but lucky for me, everybody else still also believed in me and backed me. And, um, you know, I say it's my win, but it's just as much everybody else's win because it was a long journey for them too. Uh, You're cute that way. Um, Free golf, just in the interest of understanding, because that's always my goal for the folks listening to this. I want them to have something they can chew on. And uh, they're like, well, Ashley said to play free golf. Now, free golf could be kind of all encompassing. Uh, Mm. Define free golf. Is it as simple as like getting a yardage, seeing the shot, pulling the trigger? or, Or is there more to it than that? I think what it meant for me was getting back to hitting the shots that I see. Okay. Um, you know, not just being one dimensional. I'm a very field based player. Like I said, Doug has taught me and given me the ability to hit multiple shots. And maybe sometimes, particularly in the women's game, you know, in the men's game, they can do it. You see guys hit it all different ways. But in the women's game, majority of the girls hit a draw. Yeah. Fairly standard. They don't have multiple shots. Um, yeah. And we've had this conversation many times that sometimes it was maybe to my detriment, but there were going to be weeks when I needed it. And eventually I started to back myself in the shot I see. That's the shot I'd hit. Um, you know, sometimes it's going to come off and not come off. And then it became more of, okay, see the space that you want to hit it into and on a green or on a fairway. Where's your big space? When's the time to take it on? And then we started just to make better calculated decisions from there too. Awesome. Wow, what a cool story! Um, yeah. what, so cool to catch up with you. I appreciate your time. Okay, for now you've got you've garnered a whole bunch of new global fans. Where do they go to find out more information from you? Is there social media or website that sort of stuff? Uh, no website, social media. Most active on Instagram. Uh, it's probably something that I'm going to have to improve a little bit with. Okay. Um, never That's been done. major on social media, but obviously now there's a little bit more interest. So. That's um, where people can find out where I'm playing and obviously on lpga.com is where all our tournaments are. So what's the handle? 22 Open Champion? Uh, open Champion or <laughs> what's the name? Uh, of- Ash, Ash Buhai Golf. All right, Buhai. Yeah. Ashley, so proud of you. So happy you would join us. Thanks for your time. Um, all the very best in the future. We uh, Lots of fans in the background here with our fingers crossed. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it.